Thank you, Tim. I appreciate it. Thanks to all you brave souls that came out and uh, braved the monsoon. <laughs> Tim said that uh, students dissolve in the rain so they don't take a chance out here. So glad you guys came. Tim and I both have a, a friend who lives in Little Rock, Arkansas. His name is Mike. Mike used to work for a marriage ministry, and Mike's job was promoting marriage conferences. He would travel from city to city in advance of the conference, and he would do radio and print interviews to get people interested in the conference. So Mike went to one city, and he had a live radio interview scheduled, and he was running behind. So he's hurrying to the station, and as he runs in the door and comes up to the recording studio, the on-air light above the door, it clicks on as he's coming down the hallway. So the interview, It started without him. So he quietly walks into the studio, flashes the guy a sorry smile, and sits down, and the interview starts. Mike suddenly realizes that he never got this guy's name. He thinks the guy's name is Bob, but he's, he's not sure. So while the interview is going on, Mike is looking around the office, around the recording studio for something with the guy's name on it, like graduate of Biola University, Bob. <laughs> Thank you for 25 years of meritorious service, Bob. But there is nothing anywhere. He thinks it's Bob, but he can't take a chance on saying it if that's not his name. And to make matters worse, this is a super friendly guy. And he's dropping Mike's name right and left. Oh, Mike, it's so good to have you here, Mike. My old friend Mike is here, and it's just getting worse. All Mike can do is say, it's good to be here, pal, and it's sounding bad. Suddenly, it dawns on Mike that this is radio, not television. Nobody can see what he's doing. So while the guy's talking, Mike takes out a piece of paper, and he writes, Bob, with a big question mark, and holds it up to the guy. The guy looks at it and goes, Oh, I'm sorry, Bob. I've been calling you Mike all this time. Which is pretty much how I feel here at Biola. So uh, I've met some of you already. I've already forgotten your names. Please don't take it personally. I'll just call you Bob, okay? Even you. You're Bob. All right. I came there today to, to show you a hidden passage of Scripture. It sounds mysterious, doesn't it? Hidden in plain sight. It's a passage, I'll bet, you have never heard a talk or a sermon preached on before, even though it's hidden in one of the most famous and one of the best-known chapters in all the New Testament. You know, this happens from time to time in history. Back around 1518, Martin Luther was a priest and a professor at Wittenberg University, and he was reading the book of Romans one day, when all of a sudden he read Romans 1.17, which says, for in it... The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Now, Luther said when he read that passage, it's as though it had been hidden, like a spotlight was shining on it, like it leapt off the page. He said, when I read this, it's as though the doors to heaven were flung open wide and I walked through. And it was that reading that really kicked off the Protestant Reformation. The irony is Luther had read the passage, at least his eyes had passed over it, hundreds of times. But it was hidden in plain sight. For some reason, on that day, in the providence of God, it became relevant and meaningful. He got it. And I'm going to show you a passage exactly like that. You'll find it in John chapter 4. I'll show it to you in just a minute. John chapter 4, you probably remember, is the story of the woman at the well. Is there any better known chapter in the Gospels? Let me do a little Google Earth view here to give you some context. Jesus and his disciples, they're on their way to Galilee. They have to pass through Samaria, not a popular place for Jews, right? They stop to rest at a well. Jesus sends the disciples into the nearby town of Sychar for food and supplies. While the disciples are gone, a woman with a water jar approaches to draw water from the well. Remember? They strike up a conversation where Jesus reveals to her information about her that no ordinary man could know. And their conversation culminates with her saying, I know that when the Messiah comes, he'll explain all things. And Jesus says to her, I who speak to you am he. And at that, she drops the water pot and runs into the town and tells everybody, come. See a man who told me all things I ever did. Bit of hyperbole there. But when you got somebody working in public relations, 
you want a bit of a storyteller, right? Come see a man who told me all things I ever did. And the entire town empties out. The whole town comes out to hear Jesus. Now, in ministry, it doesn't get any better than that. If I can send one of you out of here and the whole campus comes back, you did a real good job. I put you on speed dial. So right at the end of that famous passage is where you come across a hidden passage. Let me ask you first of all, how many of you have ever heard a talk or ever heard a sermon on the things I just described? The woman at the well, the fields are white for harvest. How many of you have ever heard a talk or a sermon? Put your hands up high. Has anyone in here never heard a talk or a sermon on the passage? You've never heard anybody talk about it before. Everybody in the room has heard that, right? So everybody's coming. The disciples offer Jesus food. Jesus says, I have food to eat that you know nothing about, right? And then Jesus quotes an old proverb to them. You say, four months until the harvest, I say to you, lift up your eyes. The fields are ripe for harvest. All sound familiar? Let me show you a passage you've never seen before. This begins in verse 36. Even now, the reaper draws his wages, Jesus is speaking. Even now, he harvests the crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus, the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Now, let me do another survey. How many of you have ever heard a talk or a sermon specifically on these four verses? One guy. Now, don't you find that odd? Two, two out of this room. Don't you think it's strange that the first part of John 4 is so famous that you've all heard sermons on it, but almost nobody has ever heard this address? Why is that? I think it's because until recent times, at least in recent days, this has been a hidden passage because it hasn't been relevant to us. It's been a huh, not an aha. But now in recent times, this is becoming especially relevant to us. Let me show you the very last verse of the Gospel of John. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books which were written. You know what John is saying? John is saying, when you read my gospel, don't get the idea that I just scraped together every little bit of information I could find on Jesus. So some of it's important and some of it's esoteric, but sorry, it's all there is. No, what John is saying is, I had a world of information to draw on. So when you read my book, you ought to ask yourself, why is this in here? Why is it important and what does it have to do with me? I believe that this hidden passage of scripture has become especially relevant to the time in which we live because it contains what I like to call the four principles of the sower. We're gonna take some time to go through and talk about them, then I'm gonna open it up for Q&A, okay? So keep note of those questions. Principle number one, sowing and harvesting are two different forms of ministry. As I said before, when it comes to ministry, it doesn't get any better than it was right then. Talk about success, evangelistic success. An entire city comes out to hear what Jesus had to say. So right in the middle of this incredible success, Jesus, for some strange reason, thinks it's important to turn to his disciples and introduce this topic. He introduces this metaphorical sower. He is recognizing not only the guy that gets results like they were about to do, but the people who came before them who did all the long, slow, hard, behind-the-scenes work to make those results possible. Harvesting, sowing. Now let me define the terms the way I use them. I would define harvesting as what you think of when I use the word evangelism. When you train someone to do evangelism, you're training someone to harvest which means you use the four spiritual laws or knowing God personally or Romans Road or the bridge or whatever tool you use. Harvesting is a short, concise attempt to communicate the gospel to someone and to invite them to make a decision for Christ. Is that evangelism or what? Harvesting. So what is sowing? Well, sowing is all the long, slow, hard, maybe years long, behind the scenes efforts to get that person ready to be able to listen to you. When I was in grade school, 
In gym class, we used to play a game called cage ball. Anybody ever play cage ball here? No, I'm so glad it's gone out. (laughs) Cage ball is a game actually named after the ball itself. It's a ball six feet in diameter, which is too big to support itself, so it has a metal cage inside it. It's basically a rubber bladder, canvas skin, and a metal cage. Now, what everybody would do in here, if you'd like to play later, we'd split into two teams, Half you get at this wall, half at this wall. You get in the crab walk position. Anybody remember that one? Invented, yes, in Japanese prisoner of war camps during World War II. You, you get down like this, hands on the ground, feet on the ground, and you skittle around like a crab. Now in cage ball, they set the ball in the middle of the room, everybody comes skittling up, and you kick the ball as hard as you can. Now guess what happens when you kick a cage ball? Nothing. It weighs way too much. One kick does nothing to a cage ball. It takes your entire team kicking in a frenzy. Cage ball looks like piranhas feeding. You're kicking like mad at this ball and if enough of you kick at just the right time, you get the momentum of the ball going in the right direction. It's just the opposite of soccer. In soccer, one guy, one ball, take your shot, you score or you miss. Cage ball, it takes your entire team kicking like mad. And I think that's a great word picture of what sowing looks like. You know, Jesus once said that ministry is sort of like sowing seed on soil. He said that every human life has a soil. Think of it as the attitude or atmosphere that a person has in their life that makes belief in the gospel either easy or hard. Every individual being has a soil and every culture has a soil as well. What creates soil? The answer is glaciers create soil and it works the same way in human lives. It's a slow, almost evolutionary process that results from thousands, millions of daily conversations and interactions that change the attitude or atmosphere in a human life or in a country so that that person is either prone to hear the gospel, primed to hear the gospel, or foreign and alien to it. That world of small daily interactions, not saying everything, but saying something, that's the world of the sower. You got to ask the question, why did Jesus bother to tell his disciples about the sower? The reason, I think, pastors don't speak on this little hidden passage is they don't know what to do with it. It, It's so out of place, isn't it? It's almost like we all worked for a company and you're all my salesmen. So I throw a big sales conference to congratulate you because everybody's met their sales quota for the fourth quarter. So here we are, feasting, and I get up to speak. Who's got the best sales team in the world? We do. Of course, really the only reason you could sell anything, I suppose, is because other people introduced the product to them in advance and they had a favorable attitude towards it. So I guess you could say that really all you were doing is reaping the benefits of somebody else's hard work, so... I mean, I'd be raining on your parade, wouldn't I? And in effect, that's what Jesus was doing. You better believe the disciples were celebrating when they saw a whole city turning out. And yet Jesus turns around and rains on their parade. He basically says, somebody else made this possible. Their work was harder than yours. All you're doing is picking low-hanging fruit. Let's all celebrate. Now, why would he do that? I think he did it because there was a danger that they would lose perspective. And it's a danger that we still have to this very day. As Tim said, I've worked for the organization of Crew, a name I'll never get used to using. I played no role in picking the new name, Campus Crusade for Christ. They changed the name because they said it was becoming culturally insensitive. They asked for suggestions. I sent in Holy Soldiers of the Flaming Cross. (laughs) I left Crusade out. I thought that was good. (laughs) I have worked for Crew for 34 years. Crew began its history about the same time as InterVarsity and the Navigators and Billy Graham's organization. The point is, there was nothing unique about our organization. There were a number of evangelistic organizations that began around the same time and they all experienced the same success. It was remarkable. I didn't grow up going to church. I don't know what your background is like. But when I was 18 and went off to college at Indiana University, I I had never been in a church. 
I'd never seen the inside of a church. You can't know less about the Bible than I knew back then. And yet, in the sovereignty of God, in my very first month on campus, somehow I became a Christian through the ministry of crew. And crew at the time used the four spiritual laws. So somebody went through it with me. I made a decision for Christ. They handed me the booklet and said, go do that with somebody else. And so I did. Because, you know, in that day, it was that easy to do. You would walk up to people and say, did you ever see one of these before? Can I go through this with you? And they would say, why, sure. And then you'd sit down and hand it to them and they would go, would you look at that? It's like a book, only smaller. It's like a booklet. <gasps> and it was low-hanging fruit, not just for crew, but for NAVs, InterVarsity, for Billy Graham. The problem in life is sometimes your success is your own worst enemy. So as a result of the incredible evangelistic success that we experienced, there were three things that happened that we began to struggle with. Here they are. First, we thought that we had entered a perpetual harvest. Let me ask you a radical question. You won't hear this one a lot. But back in that passage in John 4, when, when Jesus said, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are ripe for harvest, was he stating a timeless truth? Or was he saying something about the specific field of his day? If he was stating a timeless truth, now that the Messiah has come, all fields everywhere will be perpetually ripe for harvest, he sure picked a strange metaphor, a farming metaphor. Because ask any farmer and they'll tell you there are seasons in farming and no field is forever ripe for harvest. Harvest is just a season. Then the field's life follow. And then you plow them up and then you weed and water and plant and wait. Then you have a harvest season once again. Think about Germany at the time of Martin Luther. Then think about Germany at the time of Adolf Hitler. Same country, but a very different cultural climate. But we told ourselves we have entered a perpetual harvest. So the problem is we began to forget that there was any other work to be done in ministry. And it's been very difficult for us to catch up on the other necessary skills. I come here from North Carolina. We grow a lot of tobacco. Tobacco's not in the best of times these days. North Carolina is a tobacco state. But there's a lot of farmers who are kind of seeing the handwriting on the wall. So they're trying to switch over to maybe corn with all the ethanol. Corn's profitable these days. The problem is the equipment that you need and the skills and knowledge that you need are very different for growing tobacco and for growing corn. So farmers have to retool and they're very slow to do so. What you find is farmers who are growing a crop that's no longer profitable because they don't know how to do anything else. And that's kind of a problem for us. We thought we'd entered a perpetual harvest. This is all we'll ever have to do. Second thing that happened, we began to equate harvest with ministry. You could say we became like migrant workers here in, in uh, Southern California who go from orange grove to orange grove they only operate in a harvest season, right? All they do is pick oranges. Well, you know, those guys could actually come to see themselves as orange farmers, orange growers. Well, ask one of them, how big are the trees when you plant them? Uh, you just know, you pull the fruit. You just reach up like this and you pull the fruit. Well, how much water do these trees take throughout the year? Do you just leave the ground the way it is? Do you have to weed around the trees at all? No, you just, you reach up like this and you just, you just pull the fruit off. That's, that's oranges. That's what we do. And that's our problem is we've become like migrant workers. If we're in a perpetual harvest, harvesting is all we ever have to do. And we have forgotten what it even means to sow. Third thing that happened. Worst of all, we began to devalue the role of the sower. We began to think of those people that do the long, slow, years long behind the scenes work. That's a second rate role. If they had a little more faith, if they had a little more courage, they'd harvest like the less of us. But actually, that's just not a big deal. Imagine that you are a farmer and it's the harvest season. Harvesting on a farm is a kind of consummate event. Everybody is working in the harvest. Usually, you're working against a deadline like rain or hail. So in the middle of a harvest, if one of your ranch hands, farm hands is hoeing, you would say, hey, fool, you want to put down the hoe and contribute here. 
And essentially that's what we've said to our sowers. We're in a perpetual harvest. Get out there and harvest. What are you doing hoeing, watering, planting? If you had a little more faith, a little more courage, a little more vision, you'd step up here with the rest of us. So here's what I think has happened. You become a Christian. We train you how to do evangelism. And by evangelism, what you will learn to do is harvest. Here's the four spiritual laws, knowing God personally, Romans Road, the bridge, whatever it is you use. Let me teach you how to use this. And now you ought to share your faith. So get out there. So you do. Dutifully, you take your four spiritual laws, Romans Road, whatever it is, and you go out and look for someone you can do this with. Now, it's not easy, is it? Problem is, I start looking for someone who's ready. So first, I spot this woman. I don't know. Because on her car, she had this bumper sticker, and it said, a woman without a man is like a fish without a bicycle. I I don't think she's going to be friendly to this. I don't think I know how to talk to a feminist. I'm not sure if I can do that. Then I, I, I come to this guy. And this guy, I peek in his window. He's got an Osama bin Laden poster on his wall. I think, I I don't even know. I I don't know if I can do that. Then I walk over here and I think, oh no, it's another ethnic group. I don't know if I can do that. I don't know their background. I don't know if I'm going to be embarrassed if I do this. I'm not sure if I should talk to them. I've got an African-American friend who says, you know, it's funny, to white people, blacks never look ready. (laughs) Isn't that funny? Actually, it isn't really funny at all. See, what I'm doing, because this is all I can do, I'm looking for somebody I can do this with. I'm looking for somebody I can say it all to, someone who will be that patient, someone who will listen. You know who I'm looking for? I'm looking for somebody white, pasty white, middle-aged, with conservative social values, preferably a Republican. (laughs) You know what I'm doing? I'm looking for me, right? I'm looking for somebody just like me. So the gospel is supposed to be going to the corners of the earth and reaching all kinds of unreached people groups. And you know who it's reaching? Us. Because we end up talking to ourselves. Because I can't say everything to a person, I say nothing. Because nothing else matters. Right? If you don't say it all, you said nothing. That's a harvester's mindset. So what's happening today more and more is that we are saying less and less to more and more people. And I think that's causing the Christian and secular worlds to polarize and separate. We're one way, we're another way. I don't know what I could say to them. The truth is, you can say something to anybody. You just can't say everything. You could say that's a sower's motto. I can say something to anybody, even if I can't say everything. The question we have to ask ourselves, is that important? Is that of any value? We are being marginalized. The culture is more than happy for us to be separate. The truth is, so are we. Because at heart, we're separatists. And I'm gonna come back to that thought in a minute. That's principle number one of the sower. And that is, sowing and harvesting are just two different forms of ministry. Here's principle number two. The harvester's success depends on the work of the sower. Notice Jesus says, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. It's a slap in the face, isn't it? Nobody wants to be accused of benefiting from somebody else's labor, going through the revolving door and somebody else's push. But what Jesus is really implying is that the disciples' role there that day, the esteemed role, It was really just to gather what somebody else had prepared for them. They were just picking low-hanging fruit. Crew has changed a lot over the years. I think all of our organizations have. 30 years ago, when you were a junior, if you were involved in our student movement, we would begin to put pressure on you to join staff, right? We would tell you, would you like to do something significant with your life? Would you like your life to actually matter? What are you going to do now? I'm going to be a doctor. Eh. What you ought to do is make your life count. You want to make your life matter. You want to become a part of the Great Commission, meaning you want to join the staff of crew. Now, if you agreed to do this, you became one of our student movement heroes. And at the next weekly meeting, we would invite you up on stage and we would showcase you. Here is someone with vision. Here is someone who has committed their life 
to the Lord. Let's all show him our appreciation, right? Now, if you just wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer, or if you wanted to found Microsoft or something low end like that, you would kind of sneak out with your tail between your legs. The people that actually joined our organization were like our war heroes returning from Afghanistan. Let's throw them a parade. But the people that went off to be doctors and lawyers were like soldiers returning from Vietnam. And a friend of mine once said to me, you know, it took me 10 years to recover from that. Now, crew has changed a lot over the years. Now we talk a lot about every student sent. And that means whatever it is you choose to do when you graduate, we see that as the work of God in your life. We commission you. We'll break a bottle of champagne over your head too. We want to think we are sending you out to do whatever it is God has called you to do. But it wasn't always like that. The truth is, you are in ministry. It's not that one day you might be, you, you are in ministry. First Corinthians chapter five, remember? That's where we're told that we are ambassadors for Christ. The fascinating thing about that little passage when you read it is it's not dependent on your gifting. It has nothing to do with spiritual gifts or your role in a church. It's a general calling of all believers everywhere. You've been assigned the role of ambassador. That's what you're here for. It's a very interesting thing. We're told in scripture that when you trust Christ, when you place your faith in him, your citizenship is in heaven. That means you're not Americans. You may think you are, but you actually went down to the State Department and you filed papers to change citizenship when you asked Christ into your life. You are now a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And the question we should ask is, what am I doing here? Well, you remain here because you have a role to play. You've been assigned as an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven to, in your case, America, congratulations, get to work. First Corinthians 5 tells us that it's as though God is entreating the world through us. You are the voice of God. You are his representative here. You are his ambassador. You know, an ambassador is a highly skilled job. In the State Department hierarchy, ambassador is at the top. They're presidential appointees. Highly skilled people with social skills, savvy, wisdom. It's a high-end job, but we're not very good at being ambassadors. Christians have learned how to be witnesses and martyrs. We're very poor ambassadors. We've learned how to take a stand, but we refuse to learn how to take a seat. An ambassador is a diplomat. We have to learn to compromise, and you never compromise fundamental beliefs or values. Everything else is up for grabs. When you're a diplomat, you learn those skills. And in this kind of a world, we're gonna need those skills more than ever before. Everybody here is in ministry. Congratulations, you just didn't know it. The president wasn't here to shake your hand, but you know, you are called to be an ambassador exactly like mine. If you think about it for a minute, there are two ways an ambassador can blow his job. The first would be if he never leaves home. See, an ambassador is called to live in tension. He's called to live between two worlds. And that's a tiring, exhausting tension, isn't it? So your first mistake would be if you refuse to leave home. If you ever saw the movie Gandhi, then you saw the scenes of the British ambassador to India. Essentially, he went to India and built a British palace. The only Indians there are the people who work as his servants to serve high tea. When you watch those scenes in the movie, you get this feeling of, distaste, the arrogance of this guy. He doesn't even want to talk to the Indian people. All he wanted to do is transplant a piece of Great Britain to India so they could rule. How arrogant can you be? Now, the other mistake that an ambassador can make is to get so immersed in the culture that he's supposed to be contacting that he gets lost. He changes citizenship again. He just becomes a citizen of the other country. Boy, does he know the people and the values and the language, but he forgot where he's from. But to stand right there in the middle, wow, what a hard thing to do. What a tough tension to keep, but that's exactly what we have been told to do. I believe that we are entering a sewing cycle in our culture's history. I think we've been there for the last 20 years. I believe the future of ministry belongs to sowers. Just as for farmers, when a harvest season ends, the future of farming belongs to planters, cultivators, 
weeders, hoers, waterers, all the work that has to be done before the next harvest season comes around. And if our sowers won't sow, there will be nothing to reap. When I wrote Finding Common Ground, I submitted a different title. I wanted to call it The Last Harvest. They said, do you really want to depress people? And then they changed my title. But I thought it was a good title because I sort of led off with a parable about a farmer who only wants to harvest but refuses to plant or weed or water. You know, if you go through a harvest season and you bring in the sheaves, but all you want to do is do that, you could go back into the field and find gleanings left over, right? You could do it a little bit more, but pretty soon you're going to find there's nothing in that field at all. And often when it comes to ministry, that's what we have done for the last 20 years. The fields were ripe for harvest. The fields started to thin. We only knew how to do one thing, so we just kept doing it. We have less and less results, but we just keep doing the same thing. Instead of recognizing we're not harvesters, we're farmers. And sowing is a part of farming. And if a harvest season has come to an end, it's time to do a different form of farming. So, principle number one, sowing and harvesting are two different forms of ministry. Principle number two, the harvester's success depends on the work of the sower. And then, principle number three, the sower has the harder job. Verse 38 again. Others have done the hard work, Jesus said. In New American Standard, it says others have labored And that Greek word means toil, resulting in weariness. It means laborious toil or trouble. What Jesus was saying is the sower's role is more difficult than the harvester's role. You owe a debt to them. He was saying, and you'll see it in the text, you have reaped the benefits of their laborious trouble. They did the hard work, and you get to see the results. He was esteeming the role of the sower. It's a funny thing because for us, we tend to think that harvesting is the pinnacle of all ministry because it's about results, right? So those who are involved in harvesting forms of ministry, those are our champions. That's the tough job. Jesus said, oh no, uh uh-uh, no, no. The hard job was for people who came before that person to prepare the soil, to prepare that human life, to prepare an entire nation so they were even ready to listen so that you could do what you're doing today. All you're doing is picking the low-hanging fruit. Jesus said, sowing is the hard job. You know why that is? Because sowing is an advanced ministry skill. You know what the ministry of crew is really founded on? a lot like NAVS and a lot like InterVarsity. You know what it was really founded on? The idea of transferable concepts. That I can take this little four laws and when I've received Christ, you can teach me to do it. I can teach you to do it. You can give it to him. He can teach her to do it. We can just keep passing it on. It's so simple. Anybody can learn to do this. Sewing isn't like that. Not just anybody makes a really good ambassador. Sewing is an advanced ministry skill because it involves wisdom and restraint, subtlety and savvy, and social skills. And those are qualities that are in short supply in the Christian world today. We need them and we need to cultivate them. I'm gonna show you a passage I find fascinating. I've I've just loved to write a book about this. Matthew chapter 10. Jesus, for the very first time, is pairing up his disciples and he's sending them out to have their own first contact with with non-believing and potentially hostile people, okay? Now, these are not freshmen. So far in their experience, the disciples have already seen Jesus teach the multitudes, heal the sick, cast out demons. They are not beginners. They've had a lot of experience. But Jesus waits for this moment to give them this piece of advice, If you're going to have contact with unbelieving people, potentially hostile skeptics, he says, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Now, I want you to stop and think about the metaphors he just used and try to think of yourself as a first century Jewish person. The metaphor of the serpent and the dove, would they have had any meaning to you? What would the serpent have represented to you? Satan, what would the dove have represented to you? 
The Spirit of God. So what were they really hearing him say? What was he actually saying? If you're gonna go out and have actual contact with unbelieving and potentially hostile people, what you need to do is to be as innocent as heaven and as shrewd as hell. So long, good luck. Now you talk about tensions, that's your assignment as an ambassador. How you doing on that? Did you ever walk a balance? Did you ever get up on a balance beam? Nobody's in the gym, thought you'd give it a try. Did you ever step up on a balance beam? There's a reason men don't do the balance beam. You know that? Do you know what you did when you got up on that balance beam for the first time? Something very human. It's something instinctive. The minute you stepped up on there, you realized it was only a matter of time before you would fall off because balances are exhausting to maintain. So what you instinctively did when you first got up there is you looked left and you looked right. What you were doing is looking for a soft place to fall. Right? Best place to fall off. This is what we do. Jesus said, I'm assigning you a balance. I want you to be innocent and shrewd. We step up on the beam and we start looking around. I'm gonna fall, I can't, I can't keep this going. So I'm looking for the best place to fall off and guess which way Christians fall. We fall towards innocence. Because I at least wanna be able to say to God, look, I, I did what I was supposed to do. I can't help how he responded. At least I was innocent of the blood of all men. Our preference for innocence, that default towards innocence, the result has been we have a real shortness of shrewdness in the Christian world today. And that's a real problem. You know, in the church, we have movements of personal holiness. We've had it throughout the history of the church. Anybody here ever hear of a movement of personal shrewdness? Why do we even smile at that? Why do we even laugh? Do you, you know that's part of your assignment. If you've achieved holiness, you're halfway there. How's your shrewdness? The problem we're getting into in this kind of a culture with the values that it has today is we do not appear to be shrewd. It's not a part of our stereotype. And it's a valuable sower's skill. We think the world's getting more hostile to us. Can I tell you the truth? Sometimes it's our fault because we're rude or insensitive or obnoxious or separatist, we will not understand how they think or what their values are or what offends them. We just say what we ought to say and what they do with it is up to them, at least I'm innocent of the blood of all men. I had a youth minister tell me once that he was gonna take his, his star students downtown to an inner city urban area and he was literally gonna have them stand up on a box and do street preaching. And so I asked this guy, do you think that's the most effective way to reach people in an urban area? And he gave me this look like, what are you talking about? What does that have to do with anything? So what he was telling me is, we're not doing this to reach people in the urban area. We're doing this as a challenge for our students. The problem is, ministry tends to take on an I dare you mentality. Hey, you think that was humiliating? Try this. It takes real commitment and courage to try that. But you know, courage isn't always doing the silliest or most outlandish thing. Jesus said we might be called on to be fools for his sake, but he wasn't asking for our help, right? Sometimes the best thing to do is something shrewd, and it might be quiet, and it might be peaceful. It might be easy to do, but if it was the shrewd thing to do, maybe it was the best. So do you desire to walk in holiness and innocence before God? Congratulations, you're halfway done. How's your shrewdness? We don't work on our shrewdness, do we? Shrewdness means taking the time to learn the position of someone who disagrees with you. It means having thick enough skin to listen to ignorance and error and even outright hostility. Shrewdness means learning to speak in the accepted language of your listener. It means learning to respect what is right in the sight of all men. Shrewdness means learning when to speak and when to just shut up and keep your mouth closed. Shrewdness means developing tact and timing and patience and strategy. And I know when I, when I list all these things, you're thinking, that is so much work. I know, Jesus called it the hard work. That's why he said the sower has the hardest job. So the first three principles, sowing and harvesting, are two different forms of ministry. Second, the harvester's success depends on the work of the sower. Third, 
The sower's got the harder job. And then principle number four, the sower and the harvester work together as a team. The reaper harvests the crop, as it says, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. If the harvester doesn't do what he's supposed to do, what was the point of all that sowing, all that long, slow, behind-the-scenes work? What was the point if the harvester won't harvest? But if the sower won't sow, what's the harvester going to do? He's got nothing to harvest because people aren't ready and aren't willing to listen to him. So we are working together as a team, and we're supposed to be glad together. Well, when are we together? See, that's the problem. The only time the sower and the reaper are together is in heaven. Because on that day when Jesus turned to his disciples and told them about the sower, you think there were any sowers hanging around? No, the sowers had long ago moved on. They were working in another field. They were preparing another group of people, another culture. That means the disciples that day would see the results, but the sowers didn't. The problem for us in ministry is we have a very strong desire to quantify. There are good reasons for it. If in an organization you want to know how your staff are doing, you've got to count something. If you want to tell your supporters that you raise money from, this is why you should give me more money, you need to give them some numbers. You need to quantify something. The problem ultimately, can I be honest with you, is that ministry is unmeasurable. In ministry, ultimately, you don't know what it is you're accomplishing. Remember what Paul once said? He said, I planted, Apollos watered, God was causing the growth. Well, if I plant and somebody else waters and God's the one that causes the growth, I don't really know what it is I'm accomplishing out there. And I don't think we're going to know until heaven. And that means if you're gonna be a sower, you need a philosophical commitment to sowing because you're not gonna get to count results. What keeps a farmer weeding? No farmer can hoe up a few weeds and say, you know, that's gonna result in a 2.4% yield increase in the harvest. He has no way to know what weeding even did that day. So why does he do it? Because he knows he benefits from it. He has a philosophical commitment to the role of weeding. And that's what we have to have when it comes to sowing too. You know, in heaven, no harvester is ever gonna celebrate alone. I think we do imagine that we'll get to heaven and there'll be masses of people, but pedestals shooting up from place to place. There'll be Billy Graham standing on these and Bill Bright standing on others. I don't think that's true. I think it's gonna be a level playing field. And I think what you're gonna find is a harvester surrounded by a thousand sowers they never met before. But they are the people who are actually responsible for the success that the harvester was able to see. I think America is in a sowing cycle and has been for quite some time. That does not mean that the harvest is over. It does mean, I think we've all experienced this, that the harvest is less plentiful than it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. The fields are less abundant. You got two choices. You can go back and just keep harvesting or you can do what the fields require of you. Every time we talk about harvest, think about it for a minute. You walk into a church, you see a church bulletin, there is an image of a harvest on the bulletin. What does it look like? What's it look like? It's a wheat harvest, isn't it? You see golden fields, and we sing songs about bringing in the sheaves. Well, that's only one kind of harvest. See, that kind of harvest is a one-time, brief, consummate event. When the wheat is ready, you're racing against the clock. You don't want the moisture content to build up too high. Same thing with corn. You gotta get it in before the rain or before the hail. So you get out, mow it down, bring it in. What kind of harvest are we involved in in ministry? I'd suggest it looks a lot more like tomatoes. But bringing in the tomatoes doesn't make a very good song. <laughs> My dad grew world record tomatoes. We looked it up in the book, Guinness Book of World Records. We had 12 foot tall tomato plants. You had to reach them with a ladder. My dad grew one pound tomatoes. It was his specialty. And every day he would get on his little Boland's 12 horsepower tractor with the wagon behind it and he would putter down to the end of the house to work on the tomato plants. Now you better believe dad went looking for ripe tomatoes. But when he didn't find any, he didn't just throw up his hands in despair and go home. 
he basically said to his tomato plants, what do you need from me today? So sometimes he'd pull off a few suckers. Sometimes he'd tie up a vine. Sometimes he'd pull a few weeds or fertilize or water. He was working in a cooperative way with the tomato plants, and that's what we do. Even a farmer with a wheat harvest, he's got a schedule in mind, but if the moisture content's not right, if the field's not ready, he does not insist on mowing it down. He's got to say to the field, when do you want to be harvested? When are you going to be ready? I'm not trying to get people to quit harvesting. What would be the point in that? If I was saying to people, stop doing that form of evangelism, I'd be committing the same error that I'm writing about and talking about. What I'm trying to say is, in your ministry toolbox, you need an entire variety of tools, right? Because if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And you can't always use a nail. So as you go out and have contact with different people day to day, I would challenge you with the idea that you can say something to anybody. You just can't say everything. So what you want as a sower growing in your skill and savvy is a full toolbox so that you can walk out, open up your toolbox, and say, now what can I use today? What would be appropriate in this situation? And use the right tool. Our problem is, because we thought we were in a perpetual harvest, we've only got one tool. And more and more, when the tool doesn't seem to fit, it doesn't seem to be timely or appropriate, we just close the toolbox and go back home. That's a shame. That's a shame. You can't say everything to everybody. You can say something to anybody you ever meet. And that's the way I'd like you to go out of here. Anybody you meet, I don't care how much they hate you. I don't care how hostile they are in your position. There is something that you can say to them that's gonna pique an interest raise a question, create a better atmosphere between you, shatter a stereotype, and what you're doing is creating soil, right? And you may never see results in that person's life. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because Jesus thought on the day when they saw more results than he ever saw in his ministry, it was important to turn to his disciples and say, you didn't make this happen. People came before you. They did the hard work. One day, you'll celebrate together, but they've moved on. All you're going to do today is pick low-hanging fruit. I want to honor those people now. We've got to be sowers, too. All right, I'm going to break here, and I'm going to ask for questions. Then we'll take a real quick break, and I'll go back to one more bit of content after that. And then Tim and I are both going to handle some questions at the end. Yeah. That's a wonderful opportunity. You know what that person is saying to you? I'm interested in this topic. I'm willing to discuss this topic. There's an old saying, love me or hate me, but spare me your indifference. The problem that you have in ministry is indifferent people. A guy who hates you is somebody willing to talk to you. And it gives you a chance as a savvy sower to say it the right way. Correct the error. No, I don't think that's, I wouldn't say it that way. Somebody said to me one time, what's this Pat Robertson thing? You know, big hurricane or a big earthquake in Haiti, remember that? Pat Robertson says on the air, well, the reason that happened is, you know, years ago, Haiti was ruled by the French and the Haitians wanted to get rid of the French, so they made a deal with the devil and got into voodoo, that got rid of the French, but they've had problems like this ever since. Whoa, I'm sorry. Even if you actually personally believe that, do you want to say that out loud? I call that a lack of shrewdness. <laughs> so what I said to this guy is, ah, you know, I, uh, I don't know. You know, Jesus was once asked about this, about a tower that fell over and killed a whole bunch of people. And his listeners asked him, how come that happened to those people? And he said something really surprising. You know what he said? He basically said, you, you shouldn't be asking why the tower fell on them. You really should be asking, why didn't the tower fall on you? See, Jesus didn't let his followers blame or point the finger at other people. He said, when bad things happen to good people, you ought to use that as an opportunity to look at your own life and ask, what needs to be changed about me? 
Uh, that's just a shrewd answer, I think. But can I answer a broader question I think you're asking there? How do you learn to do this stuff? It comes back to the biblical issue of wisdom. We are very formula and rule oriented in the evangelical world. Give me the three points and the four steps. Give me the formula that explains how this works. And we complain about the Bible because it doesn't work as a formula. Raise up a child in the way in which he shall go. Even when he's old, he won't depart from it. Hey, my kid, I raised him up the right way and he departed from it. I guess that's not so. That's a proverb. And a proverb is a truism. It's a slice of truth about how life works in a specific context, right? And you know that when you read in Proverbs and one verse says, answer a fool according to his folly. And the next proverb says, don't answer a fool according to his folly. (laughs) How can both of those be true? Well, in, in, in their own place, in their own context, both of those are true. In a Hebrew culture, it's a wisdom-based culture. That's why for the Jews, the elders of the city would meet in the city's gates to test each other with riddles. What? Yeah, the original sport of kings. Remember the Queen of Sheba who comes to visit Solomon? She wants to test him with riddles. The original sport of kings wasn't tennis. It was wisdom. Because wisdom is developed in community with other people. You talk, you challenge each other. You you trade illustrations and examples like bubblegum cards. What do you say to this? What would you say to that? My little thing about the Tower of Siloam, you'll remember that. And you'll pull that one out and you'll use it sometime. These are the things we have to use with each other. Like elders of the city, we need to meet in the gates to develop our shrewdness. This is what we've been failing to do. What else? Yes. Do you think Jesus was acting as sower? Is that what you're asking me? I guess, like, what, I'm just wondering what, what were the sowers, or who were the sowers, people passing through? He doesn't identify them, and we can only imagine. Maybe, maybe somebody in this woman's life gave her, had some sort of interaction with her that at least made her willing to talk to a man or talk to a Jew. She had at least that kind of openness, right? Maybe somebody had to, create that soil in her life. Yeah, I don't know. You, you, it's left to your imagination to wonder who did what that made this possible on this day. What would make the whole town turn out? What, what's different about Sychar? What had happened behind the scenes that these people are so primed to find out about the Jewish Messiah? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But somebody had done things behind the scene that made them ready on that day. And all it took was a pull of the trigger. I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, like Jesus, when he was talking to the woman at the wall, he didn't explicitly share like the whole gospel. He was telling mm. her that he was the expected Messiah. He never does, have you noticed? It's hard to ever do a freeze frame on Jesus and say, there's the whole gospel, there it is right there. Tim and I were talking about this at lunch. He had a three-year conversation. What Jesus was trying to do is engage people. He didn't end conversations. He piqued interest and moved on. He always ears to hear, let him hear. Come on, we're moving, let's go, come on. And people would engage him and follow him. It's how he built his movement. This is really an interesting challenge for us because we want to say it all. We are answer people and we know we've got truth on our side. So we have what Tim likes to call agenda anxiety. I got someplace I need to go. I got to get this in, I got to get it all said. Jesus never seemed to want to say it all. He had this amazing tact. He'd tell a little story that would confuse you and then he would move on. <laughs> huh? And people, some people just, I don't want to bother with, and other people were like, what? What is, what is that? And they would end up following him. He was encouraging people to engage. This is what I'll be talking about tomorrow. I, they gave me a little 20 minute talk and I'll talk a little bit about storytelling, but this is what stories do. Stories actually engage people and that's what he wanted. What else? Yes. So, since this is something that's so missing from our modern evangelical mindset, is this something that needs to be integrated into the church or in our own personal um, working at? Well, I think it definitely needs to come into the church. 
And, and this is a tough, a tough one. You know, imagine this. Imagine that you, uh, well, I'll talk about this in a minute, so I don't want to blow it in advance, but even in a church, when there is a returning missionary, first ask yourself, what is that? What is a missionary? Well, somebody that crossed a large body of water. So when they return, they'll step up front to the stage. We'll honor them. They'll tell us, show us the slideshow. What about the guy that just became vice president of IBM? We're not going to have him up front because he's not really committed yet. If he got a vision for his life, he would come out of what he's doing and he would go on the mission field. This is something I wrote about in Finding Common Ground. In ministry, because we prefer a harvesting model, we're always calling people out. out. Come out of that. Come out of that. And do this. Make your life matter. I was at a conference speaking once and a young man came up to me. He was in his mid-30s. The guy was a full professor at a university in his mid-30s. I don't know how he pulled that off that fast. But he had a terrific gift of teaching. Just talking to him, you could see how articulate this guy was. And he said, you know, I, I teach at such and such a university. Uh, I'm also very involved with my church. And the elders of my church are saying to me, you are wasting your gift. God has given you the gift of teaching. You need to come out of that world and you need to use your gift for the building up of the church. What do you think? I said, don't do it. Because what's gonna happen is the minute we take you out of there, we're gonna try to go back there and find some sort of an insider that'll let us do ministry inside your university. You're already there. You're already an insider, but we wanna call people out. The future of ministry, I don't think, belongs to outsiders. What, what we need is dedicated Christians who are growing up within the film industry, music industry, business, anything. They're there. They're in there. And they're just learning the contact points between their faith and this field, whatever this field is. For years, I would hear Christians hold up a Bible and say, see this? The only thing you need to know is this book. Well, I couldn't disagree more. Yes, you need to know this book, but you need to know at least one other field. And then what you need to do is figure out the integration between that field and this book, or else you're of no value to us. Because your knowledge of the Bible is as though you learned macrame. It's just a hobby. It's just something you learned in a vacuum, and it has nothing to do with the real world. And that's the stereotype of Christianity in our country today, isn't it? It's got nothing to do with anything. And it's because we know it in a vacuum. What does that have to do with accounting? What does that have to do with running a company? What does it have to do with being a filmmaker? If we can't answer those questions, we're useless. We have a private devotional life, but we're having no impact on the culture at all. You need to know this book, and you need to know at least one other field, and then you need to figure out the integration of the two and come back and teach the rest of us. That's what's missing. What else? Yes. You kind of touched on how, especially Christian culture today, is so focused on the harvest, and it's obviously a lot more appealing than kind of slaving over and selling. So, um, like, what would you say to someone and where's kind of the hope in potentially never seeing the harvest or experiencing it for yourself? And just we are supposed to be doing our work before God, as unto the Lord rather than unto men. That it is the ultimate focus that you have to have. You're in ministry every single day. And when someone asks you, when's the last time you shared your faith? What we do is go back in our minds to the time we last pulled out our four spiritual laws. And then we feel guilty and ashamed. You ought to be thinking back to 10 minutes ago when you just had a conversation with somebody at the bus stop. You only said a little, you only had a little comment. But it was something, it was sowing. And that's a part of sharing your faith as well. That's why I said, you have gotta have a philosophical commitment. Not just to sowing, but to this whole idea of I serve God and I do my work before God rather than before men that that is what I do that's the commitment of my life it's where I, I draw my satisfaction because if you're going to get satisfaction from any form of performance it's going to fail you you've you've actually got into a form of idolatry you've moved that activity into the place of God uh, I'm a big fan of military history I picked up a book several years ago called how great generals win I loved it it was by a British military historian named Bevan Alexander. He was saying, if you go back through military history, you'll find that all really successful generals used some of the very same approaches. So here's a quotation from this book. 
He said one of the remarkable facts about great generals throughout history is that, except in cases where they possessed overwhelming power, practically all their successful moves have been made against the enemy's flank or rear, either actual or psychological. Great generals realize that a rear attack distracts, dislocates, and often defeats an enemy physically by cutting him off from his supplies, communication, and reinforcements, and mentally by undermining his confidence and sense of security. Great generals know a direct attack, on the other hand, consolidates an enemy's defenses, and even if he's defeated, merely forces him back on his reserves and his supplies. Isn't that fascinating? He was saying, if you go back in history, go back to Napoleon, Napoleon's most common technique was swing wide and attack the flank. He was saying if you do that, you cut off their line of supply. Also, you disorient them because they're expecting an attack from the front and here comes an attack from the rear. It discourages and disorients the enemy. Now, isn't that a fascinating thing? I did a chapter in Finding Common Ground on indirect communication because I believe that Christians are are primed and ready for frontal attack. It's what we want to do and it's what we expect. But I think the greatest damage to the Christian faith is being done by an enemy that uses attacks to the flank and to the rear. The problem that we have is we won't fight the same way. The enemy of our soul is a very good general. He knows this principle. He knows that if he mounts a frontal attack against us, After all this time, we've got our apologetics, we've got our facts, we've got our scholars, bring it on. Bring it on, frontal attack. You attack, we attack back, we'll win. We can beat you. So the enemy of your soul knows that's useless. Even if he's got overwhelming odds and he mounts a frontal attack, he's just gonna push you back against your own people, right? All that'll do is reconsolidate you and encourage you. So what he wants to do instead is apply the principle of attacking to the flank and the rear to see if he can cut off your line of supply. In other words, why do I have to defeat Christianity if I can instead defeat a belief that makes belief in Christianity even possible? So think about the TV shows that you've watched on television. I remember watching one that was a about a guy that was having a sexual relationship with his girlfriend and he confided to a friend, I don't even like her. I don't even like the woman. It's all about sex. It's a purely sexual relationship. And his friend says to him, well, look, everybody's had at least one of those and the show moves on. Now, I would challenge you with the thought that that's an incredibly powerful form of persuasion. Nobody turned to the camera. No, nobody argued about promiscuity or told you that's okay to do that, right? Somebody simply made the statement that everybody has done that at least one time. And you find yourself looking around thinking, I guess I'm the only one in the world who hasn't. I wonder if there's something wrong with me. Well, that was an attack to the flank, wasn't it? Or you're watching another TV show and you find couples who are having sexual relationships all over the place. They're just, that's just the way the show goes. But it dawns on you one day when you watch the show that nobody in the show gets pregnant. No woman ever has an abortion or spends years in counseling. There's no such thing as a sexually transmitted disease. Even though health statistics would tell you those are very real options in the real world, on the TV show, those things don't seem to exist. They're just never mentioned. I would suggest that that's an extremely powerful form of persuasion because what it's telling you is this is how the world actually operates. You know, Tolkien, who wrote The Lord of the Rings, he differed with C.S. Lewis, his fellow inkling, about what you do in fiction. What Tolkien said is what you want to do when you write fiction is create a fantasy world where the moral laws operate exactly the way they do in the real world. That way, when people read your fantasy world, they watch the moral world work and learn how things work in your world. That's what the enemy is doing to us. That's an attack to the flank, isn't it? There are three common features of indirect communication. Let me just describe them for you. Number one, there is no direct attempt to persuade. That's why we call it indirect communication. The real subject in question is not even mentioned. 
So sexuality, who discusses it on TV? They just do it. It's modeled for you, an attitude towards it is modeled, and I think that's where people draw their values. The way I like to say it is, there's a great conversation going on in our culture, and the conversation is over before most Christians know it's even begun. We're waiting for the chance to debate them on the topic, but they don't want to debate. They'll just indirectly communicate and change background attitudes. Second common feature, the attack is against the line of supply, some underlying belief or attitude that's critical to the support of the primary belief. So if, if I can make you believe in historical relativism, that history cannot be known, you can't believe in the gospel. I didn't have to attack the gospel, I didn't have to bring it up, I didn't have to mention the Bible. But if all history is unknowable, so is the gospel. The resurrection can't be known. I just destroyed your belief and never said a word about it. It was just an attack to the flank or to the rear. Third, here's the big one. The style of the communication is as attractive and enjoyable as possible. The chief weapon of indirect attack is art. If you had lived in Los Angeles 30 years ago, for most of you, you were only concepts back then. If you had lived here 30 years ago, you could have read my daily comic strip in the Los Angeles Times. That was my first job. I wrote and drew a syndicated comic strip. LA Times alone, a million readers. A million readers. I started my comic strip in college in 1975. Um, Doonesbury, if you remember, how many of you read Doonesbury? It's so funny, because it was the comic strip back in the 70s. He started in 1970. He came out of Yale's newspaper, and uh, a, a syndicate called Universal Press, syndicates are the companies that market comic strips to commercial newspapers. A syndicate called Universal Press actually got started with Doonesbury. He actually sort of built the syndicate on that one feature. Syndicates sell all the syndicated material to, to newspapers. So all the crossword puzzles, uh, the Dear Abby kinds of columns, all the advice columns, horoscopes, all that stuff in a newspaper. The majority of what you read in a newspaper didn't come from the newspaper. They bought it from a syndicate. Comic strips are just one of those items. So here's Gary Trudeau, right? And if you ever read his comic strip, Doonesbury, he's a Democrat. He's, a, he's liberal politically, and it really comes out, obviously, in Doonesbury. Well, Gerald Ford, when he was president, a Republican, he once made the statement publicly, we have three sources of information in Washington. We have electronic media, we have print media, and we have Doonesbury, not necessarily in that order. Now stop and think about what he just said. What he said is, Republicans get up every morning and we read a comic strip that espouses liberal political philosophy. We do it every day. Why? Well, the reason is it was funny. It was good. It was clever. It was creative. And if it is, nobody cares what it has to say. What's your favorite TV show? If you actually take a step back from your favorite TV show and ask, what's the moral atmosphere of the TV show? What's the worldview of the TV show? For a lot of us, our favorite TV shows are antagonistic to what we treasure most in life. But I'm no different than you, I watch them too. Because they're funny. Or because they're well done. Or they're, they're well written. The problem is, that's a very powerful form of persuasion because it's just entertainment. They're just stories, right? But they're sidling up beside you, they're disarming you, and they're actually changing the way you think. Doonesbury is a very interesting feature because it became so political, at times so controversial, that newspaper editors began to say, this doesn't belong on the comics page, it belongs on the editorial page. So they started moving it onto the editorial page. Gary Trudeau had enough power back then to say to editors, if you take my comic strip off the comics page and put it on the op-ed page, I'll take it out of your newspaper. And you know why he did that? Guess what the best read page of a newspaper is? It's the comics page. And he didn't want to just draw, he wanted to communicate. He wanted the readers. I don't, I don't know who reads the op-ed page in the LA Times. I had a million readers every day. Now you can't say much in four frames, but you can say something. 
and the chance to say something to a million people every day, I call that pretty good. Indirect communication is an extremely powerful thing, and if you think about movies and TV shows you've seen, you'll recognize the techniques of indirect communication. I just made a list of them here. It's suggested that people who hold your view have emotional or character flaws. Do you ever see that? There you go. The most foolish or contemptuous character endorses your view. Thank you very much. The most desirable characters never entertain your view. That's powerful, the absence of your view. It is suggested that people who hold your view are less intelligent or less educated. Your view is completely ignored, suggesting that it's irrelevant to daily life. A picture is created of a normal, healthy world in which your view does not exist. An ideal fantasy world, think Star Trek, or future world is pictured in which your view does not exist. We've evolved beyond that. It is suggested that your view is an evolutionary step or a childish view to be outgrown. Now tell me you haven't seen every one of those used. Isn't it true? The point is we don't think of these as forms of persuasion, but they are. Subtext. Any writer will tell you the most powerful form of communication is what you don't say. And you know that's true, because if you ever took that first step to say to a young man or a young woman, I love you, and they said nothing, (laughs) that was pretty loud, wasn't it? That was louder than anything they could have possibly said. The art of writing is the art of what you don't say. It's what you just suggest, right? Because if you say it too up front, people recognize it, their defenses go up, they turn you off. We want direct confrontation while the enemy is attacking us indirectly. So the world releases a film that's hostile to Christianity, what do we do? Write a book about it. Write a dozen books about it. Mount a protest against it. Get people to try not to go to the movie. The one thing we don't do is make a movie of our own. Isn't it funny? We're complaining about the movie they made. Why don't we make a movie of our own? And I know what you're thinking. I can't just go out tomorrow and make a movie. No, neither could they. In fact, to get to the point where they were able to make that movie, they probably invested 20 years of their life. How about you? You're not gonna walk into the film industry and make a movie. You wanna invest a life doing that? That's a life well spent. Great place to be an ambassador. It might take you 20 years to get to the point where you can do a feature film. You willing to do that? It's what the world is patient enough to do to us. Why won't we do the same thing back? Why won't we learn the art of indirect communication? What's the solution to this problem? I'm just gonna suggest three steps and then we're gonna start doing some Q&A and discussion here. Here's the steps. Step one, we have to lose our fear of art and artists. There's a quote here from Eugene Peterson's wonderful book, Subversive Spirituality. He said, we have such a fear of superstition and allegory that we squeezed all the imaginative stuff out of scripture so we could be sure that it was just precise and accurate. This great emphasis on how to communicate accurately is a dead end street. Communicating clearly is not what we're after. What we're after is creating new life. I'll talk about this briefly tomorrow. It's a bit of hyperbole here. Certainly he believes in communicating clearly and accurately, but what he is saying is our desire to make things clear, we've made clarity the highest goal to do it. We have squeezed out creativity and imagination. This is a culture that runs on imagination. For centuries, the greatest show on earth was the book of Revelation or Ezekiel. If you wanted to have your mind absolutely blown before LSD came around, you read the book of Revelation. Holy cow. These days, you go to a movie theater, anything that can be imagined, anything that can be imagined can be put on film. Did you see Gravity? There were scenes in Gravity where the only live action part of the entire shot was the face inside that visor. Everything else is created by a computer. Wow. Did you see Avatar? Holy cow. So we say to people, you know, in heaven, the streets are made out of gold. Wow, we're boring. (laughs) Sorry, we're just boring. All we got is a dragon with heads and things like that. (laughs) Harry Potter does better than that. (laughs) I've been saying for years, we really need to reimagine heaven. Christians do not like it when I say that because they hear me say, we need to reinvent heaven. No, no, we don't. We've got the data. We need to stick to the data. We need to reimagine it. 
What would it look like? How can we portray, describe heaven so that it it grabs the imagination. Paul said no human mind has ever grasped what God has prepared for us. That means the guys that made Avatar can't come close to what heaven looks like. What does heaven look like in cartoons? It's a cloud and a guy in his robe playing a harp. What does God look like? Old guy with a beard. That's all we got because we've squeezed imagination out of the picture. This is a culture that runs on imagination, and boy, are we behind. So where do we learn art? The answer is you learn art where the rest of the world learns art because art is not a Christian skill. It's a human skill. You wanna learn to tell stories? You learn to tell stories where other people do. Go to the Iowa Writers Workshop. You wanna learn to make film? Go to UCLA, go to USC, go to Long Beach State. You go where other people are learning to make film and you learn right along the rest of them. Now, this freaks Christians out. This freaks Christian parents out. You're gonna send my child there? If, if you would actually like to be a serious artist, if you really wanna develop your imagination, your storytelling ability, your ability to make film, where did you think you'd learn this? I'm sorry, but the Christian world won't be able to compete with USC, UCLA, and Long Beach State. They don't have the guns to do it. You're gonna have to learn alongside everybody else. The world sets the standard for excellence in art. When I tried to get my comic strip syndicated, I was a very young man. I started my comic strip in college. There's only half a dozen large syndicates in the United States. And I read that they get 1,500 to 2,000 submissions every year from people trying to get a comic strip started and they only buy one. Well, the odds are terrible. And I told my Christian friends, I I wanna get my comic strips syndicated. And Christian said to me, don't even try. Because in the media, there is a conspiracy against Christians. So you know what happened? I kept submitting my comic strip four times a year. It took me two and a half years. And finally, the same syndicate that did Doonesbury picked up my comic strip and I wrote that comic strip for the next six years. And I had the opportunity to visit the syndicate offices and sit at my editor's desk and look at those submissions that came across his desk. I saw what was being submitted and you know what I discovered? 90% of it was garbage, garbage. Another 5% of it was a copy, looked exactly like Charlie Brown. Another 4% of it, okay. What I was actually competing with all the time was maybe 1%, maybe 2%. And you know what I discovered? My syndicate, the guys who who started it were graduates of Notre Dame. They were committed Catholics. One of the guys there who was one of the two founders of the syndicate had done his his master's thesis on Karl Barth. I mean, they were committed Catholic guys. One of the guys who had a comic strip of the syndicate at the time was the next Mormon missionary. And here I was, I was working with crew and they took my comic strip. And you know what I realized? There is a conspiracy out there. It's a conspiracy against mediocrity. We don't often say this to ourselves, but often when it comes to art, our standards are second rate. But we want special dispensation because we happen to be Christians. And when we show them our second rate art and nobody's thrilled by it, we say, The world is hostile to Christianity. No, they just wish you'd improve your art. The truth is a publisher will publish anything that sells. They will publish anything that sells. So you you wanna write a great book, you'll find a market for it. And you write a great book, they'll let you say anything you wanna say too. But you can't say anything you wanna say just because you happen to be a Christian and use second rate art to do it. Step two. We must learn the strategy of indirect communication. Love this quote from C.S. Lewis. You've all seen it before. We must attack the enemy's line of communication. What we want is not more little books about Christianity, but more little books by Christians on other subjects with their Christianity latent. Latent means not visible. If you watch the forensic crime shows, I've written nine murder mysteries. A latent fingerprint's an invisible fingerprint. You can't see it, but it's there. It might just be oil left from the ridges of a fingerprint. It has to be made visible. 
But you know, if you like direct communication only, you don't want things latent. You want them up front. You want everybody to get it. You want to make sure that the message can't be missed. You want to put the cookies on the bottom shelf and not bury the lead, right? No child left behind. Lewis said, "Uh uh-uh, you got to bury it. We want our Christianity latent. We want the assumptions that underlie our art to be thoroughly Christian. That's what we have to do. Let people dig that up. Then third, we must grow in subtlety and patience. This is from Philip Yancey. The Christian public will applaud books in which every prayer is answered and every disease is healed. But to the degree those books do not reflect reality, they will become meaningless to a skeptical audience. Too often our evangelical literature appears to the larger world as strange and unconvincing as a moony tract or a daily worker newspaper. Isn't that good? We have truth on our side. We have a message we want to get across. And that gives us agenda anxiety. So we are always tempted as Christians to bend the rules of art. I I just want to make sure they get this. So I'm going to have one character in my book turn to the camera and share the gospel. I just want to make sure everybody gets the gospel. I'm sorry, you just broke the rules of art. There's actually a term for this. It's called special pleading. Special pleading is when you put a speech on the tongue of a character who can't bear that speech. It's artificial and it's contrived. And you know what? You've seen movies where they've done that, haven't you? You get to the end of the movie and somebody actually gives a speech and you kind of go, oh, because it's not fair. They broke the rules, right? All right, I'm going to have Tim come on up here. What I want to do is open it up for any questions on indirect communication or anything else that we've covered here. Tim and I worked together for years at the Communication Center. We used to talk about these issues every day. This is where we've lived. Yeah, let me mention uh, two observations very quickly just to support what Tim's saying. After Earth, Will Smith's blockbuster movie was panned by virtually everybody because they sniffed out Scientology. And they said, this is just a, come on, you're just trying to preach Scientology. Uh, The Adjustment Bureau, um, at the end, there is a person who gets up and gives a speech, speech. Matt, uh, Matt, Damon Matt Damon type speech, that you, God is on the street and you probably already met him or her. And Adjustment Bureau is really attacked. Flip side, Duck Dynasty, where a man said something that I think was, right, the patriarch of the show says something that I think was just stupid, I think it was insensitive. Not true. I think it was homophobic. And they still kept him because Duck Dynasty brings in a ton of money. Yeah. So a and yeah. was in a pickle. They suspended the patriarch. Duck Dynasty said, then we're out of here. He stays suspended, we're out of here. And they said, you know, I think this was long enough. Yeah, <laughs> this is good. Let's, let's bring back Duck. So there yeah. is something yeah. interesting in what you're saying. And he'll remain there un- until the show's ratings drop. Yeah, and then he's gone. And then they'll be gone. In a moral there indignation. You go. So yeah. the question here, to just play off of what Tim said is, well, if you can't say everything, if you can't make your message clear or give a speech, how do you get it across? That's called art. And there isn't any formula to do it. It's a challenge. It's a difficult thing to do. Indirect communication is an art form. I just want to get more Christians involved in doing it. All right, your questions, your thoughts. So um, what about like Charlie Brown, Christmas Charlie Brown, mm-hmm. where Linus gets up and he starts, he starts quoting the Bible? Yeah. That's played every year since it's been created. And they always, I remember one time they tried to get out and they got a ton of backlash and that, like he didn't. That's, I mean, that's kind of something. Does stuff like that still work? Um, well, here's the deal now. I grew up reading Charlie Brown. I met Charles Schultz once. Can I drop that name? Did you really? I sure did. Visited him at his studio up in Santa Rosa, California. I met Tim Downs once. Yeah. I slept at his house. He's got to get out more. Okay. But here's the deal. He has a legacy. Yeah. He's a little bit like Billy Graham. He can get up and say anything. He can say anything. But because we have respect for the legacy, we'll let him say it. Right? And, and that's the statesman-like role that Charles Schultz had. And, and when I did meet him, I just said, you know, I want to tell you, as a Christian, I really appreciate what you've been able to say. He said, you know, I think I'm the first cartoonist that's actually used scripture uh, in a comic strip. And I just thought it was a wonderful thing to do. But he started his writing in the 50s, yeah. right? And the culture really was more than happy. It was just a clever thing to do. If you started to do it now, I think you'd have more trouble doing it. Yeah. I, even I got away with it sometimes. But then I was writing in the 80s, and that's quite a while ago. What else? Yeah. Um, why do you think that we have, as Christians, as a church, we used to be um, the makers of art. We have cathedrals, we have 
about the stories like Lewis and Tolkien, um, why do you think that we've lost that now? What has happened that we don't attract artists and they aren't producing good, meaningful art that actually... Boy, we could talk for hours about this. I wish I had a short answer to your question. There's so much. I think one of the fundamental issues, it, we're very modernist at heart. The world has become postmodern. We like to think, yeah, we're postmodern too. We believe in the power of story. No, we really don't. We're very modernist. We do believe in objective truth. So one of our highest values in communication is, like Eugene Peterson said, clarity and accuracy. And if those are your supreme goals, you don't want to take chances on things like creativity and imagination because they're going to mess you up. They're going to confuse things. And really, as good modernists, we don't trust emotions and we don't trust imagination because they're going to lead you astray. Now, thinking, that's kind of a bedrock foundation. That'll keep you going in the right direction. You know, your, your intellect is as fallen as the rest of you. That's reality. But for some reason, we don't trust imagination. We don't trust creativity. Artists are sloppy, messy, and they'll communicate things. And we look at them and think, what good is that? I, I don't see the gospel in there. Every book I've ever written, an editor has said to me, could we strengthen the Christian elements in this? You know what they're saying is, could you make it more obvious? And that's what I've always said to them. What you mean is, can I make it more obvious? Yes, but that wouldn't make it better. And it's an ongoing argument that I have with Christian publishers. We, we just, we're gonna have to solve some fundamental attitudes, I think, before we can start getting back into this. Yeah, Tim, anything you wanna? No. I mean, Lewis is a good example and he's a bad example, right? I mean, World War II, the world is shaken to its core. Yeah. So Lewis is writing in the sweet spot, yeah. right? I mean, we've seen Auschwitz. We've seen what the Nazis did, what the Soviets did. And people were oh, like, hey, it was obvious this isn't working, right? It's not good. Schaefer wrote during the 60s where the wheels were coming off culturally. So with Francis Schaefer, people were open, just like 9-11. Right after that, people were open because it's like, man, this is crazy. So I do think we need to look for our opportunities and take advantage of cultural moments um, and, and jump in. But we want to jump in directly when those moments are there. And I think we have to be a bit more savvy because media is not letting us debate these issues. Right, there's a bunch of issues we want to debate today, and, and you're not going to find a voice, except maybe if you go to Fox or, or someplace that is typecast. But there, culture is not going to let us argue our points anymore. We're going to have to find unique ways, indirect ways to argue our points. And that's frustrating for many of us yeah. who have PhDs and have read apologetics, and we're loaded and ready to go, but nobody's given us those debates anymore. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Sean. Um, so This guy sounds shrewd to me. He sounds shrewd, do you think? He's good. Yeah. Some of the debate team. You should He's be ashamed really of yourself for that. You want to be innocent, <laughs> not shrewd. <laughs> no, you're exactly right. And what you're saying is, what we want to do is saturate life with Christian belief. Our problem is our Christianity is this separate thing. Here's life, here's Christianity. And I'm hoping for some prime moment when I can pull it out of the closet and get it in there. And then it always feels forced and foreign. It, this is the way we live our life. Our lives should be just saturated and it's the way we approach people. It's what we talk about. Yeah, that's what you're wanting to do. Integrate life with what it is you actually believe about God. So let me make a controversial point. Okay. Um, and if it goes bad, I'm gonna blame it on Dr. Lundy because we were talking in the back. So if you love it, it was mostly me. If you disagree with it, it was Dr. Lundy. <laughs> No, so here's, here's kind of what we were saying a little bit. You tell me what you think about this, okay? And, and feel free to be semi-offended. I, I look at Biola, I, I don't see a ton of harvesters. I, I don't see people harvesting like crazy and that's your problem. Vice versa, I don't see a ton of sowers. 
See, I don't, I don't think having a conversation is sowing. It, it, it's not de facto sowing. You could have a conversation with a person and it's not sowing, it's just a conversation. I think sowing is you're intentionally trying to impact that person. Yep. You're just doing it indirectly and, and slowly, let's say. As I look at Biola students, I, See, we come from a crusade background where when you wrote your book, we really were harvesters and we didn't have much room for sowing. Tim's book was prophetic, calling crusade back to sowing. I think, if anything, the pendulum has shifted today and, and a lot of us would say, oh man, we, just, we don't close the deal, we just move people along. Well, eventually you're gonna have to close the deal. Somebody along the way is gonna have to harvest. And as I have seen um, Biola students for 10 years now, I, I haven't seen a ton of harvesting. When I did my, um, one year, I took one year and did anonymous surveys. And I defined what evangelism was. And then I said, based on my definition of evangelism, giving a person an opportunity to receive Christ, how many of you have evangelized in the last year? The average answer was zero in, in the past year. <clears throat> so I wonder how much harvesting is happening, but I wonder how much intentional sowing is happening. So I, I don't know the answer to that question as I interact with Biola's culture. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead and then we'll go here. Yeah. I, I agree because I think Biola is such a, I think for a lot of Biola students, especially those that come from, you know, somewhere far away, I think that there's such an intense feeling of community and there's so much intense <clears throat> intentionality with, with faith and with those, with conversations with people who have those same values. But this Biola bubble thing is, is a real, you know, concept, and it's a, you know, that colloquialism has a lot of truth. So I think, you know, it kind of leads me into a question of how do I become a more intentional sower? Mm. Because I think, I think that a lot of the reason, you know, I think a lot of the reason that bio, Biola students aren't harvesting frequently is because they're afraid or they don't know how to. But a lot of it's also because, like what you were saying, is, is the season's not as ripe and there's a lot of hostility. So to meet that hostility, how do I, as, a, as someone who comes from, you know, communities and friendships back home that are largely non-Christian and largely, you know, that would just dismiss it and, and laugh at, at, at that, you know, how do I become more intentional? And, and going back, I mean, that's an awkward thing, I think, for a lot of Biola students to go back and say, you know, this is where, this is how, because to be honest, like I've changed a lot and I've grown a lot in my faith since I came here. But I go, I go back home and sometimes feel like my friends are gonna, you know, they're thinking, well, of course, you went off to Biola, like this anomaly of, of American universities. Right. Of course, you know, thinking I've been brainwashed rather than, mm -hmm. than I've been growing the two years I've been here. So, like, where do I go? Where, do I, where does that? Where does all this fit into that context? <laughs> First thing I think, show up. Tim has some things to say about yeah, that from his yeah. experiences in grad school. What you do when you go home is show up. Interact with your old friends. You go to the places where they're going. They're thinking you're now a separatist. Somebody, we were talking last night about pornography and somebody was saying, you know, in high school, if you didn't look at pornography, they thought you're somebody that went home and, and prayed and stayed by yourself all night. You know, that's what they think you're going to do. So first of all, they need to just see you. Yeah. And to see that you're human, see that you're normal, see that you can interact. Second thing I recommend more than anything else is ask questions of people. Tim is right. Sewing isn't just talking. It's an intentional effort to, to make some sort of an inroad, make some sort of a statement, open a door for a future combination. The best thing I know to do is ask questions. We're bad at it as Christians because we're answer people. We know we have an answer. So I don't want to know what you think. I want you to know what I think. Well, the best door opener of all is ask what are you doing? What are you thinking? Where are you? So I hear you got a bio. Are they brainwashing you? Yep, I guess they are. What are you into now? What are you doing? Or, you know, I, yeah, you're right. We talk about God every day. What about you? Is that on your radar? I, I haven't asked you. I haven't seen you in years. What are you thinking these days? What? You're asking and you want an answer? It's, just a, it's a radical idea that a Christian would actually ask a question and want an answer. And just do that for a while and you become likable because people will talk about themselves all night long. We'll get to you in one second, but as faculty, we're in the same boat you are. We're in the same boat you are. I, I teach at a Christian school. I go to a, a church. I, my friends are Christians. So I have to purposely put myself in places that I, I can become immersed with people. So I go to academic conferences and hang out with people. I do uh, kung fu at, at a place. 
That's why my screensaver is Kung Fu Panda. But, but, but now I'm, I'm completely immersed in a school where there's like, now I find out there's two Christians at this place, right? There's like two, three of us, and the rest of the people, I'm getting to know them. And conversations are coming up. You learn that one guy has a daughter who has some kind of chronic degenerative disease. And, and you just get to know each other. Right, you have these conversations. Um, I play pickup basketball sometimes at the Brea Community Center with a bunch of non-Christian guys. And uh, man, I thought you were a Christian. You don't set a pick like that. I said, dude, read the Old Testament. You know what I mean? Kind of a, right? So you have to put yourself in positions where you can have influence with people. And you're right, the Biola bubble is real. So I've got to find ways of breaking out of here and immersing myself in situations that allow me to be an ambassador. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was just gonna say, would it be fair to say that Biola is a place where you're being trained how to sow or harvest? Because I think that's- Yes, but let me make, yes, because we'll close the doors tomorrow if that's not true, and I won't be here tomorrow if that's not true. I took a lot of heat from some Christian circles because I, all my training was at UNC Chapel Hill, and now I go to Biola. Right? You, you go from getting a PhD at one of the top secular institutions, and now you're going to the Biblical Institute of Los Angeles? Well, how can you justify that is what my crusade friends said to me. And my only justification is we don't need one sower, we need a multitude of sowers. But let me make this argument. If you're not doing it now, you won't do it when you graduate. If you're not making the habit of reaching out and finding people, after you graduate, there's no switch that we flip and do that. So if you're not doing it now, I'm gonna bet the house is gonna, I don't think you'll do it when you graduate. So yeah, use your training, right? In karate, you learn a technique, you do the technique. So learn it here and get out there and start doing it, is what I would say. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I can say from my own experience, from going to secondary university and then working before I came to Biola, I was able to see Yeah. So let me make one suggestion, and then you can hear me blather all the time. Tim is who you need to listen to. Before you, if I were the president of the university, I'd have one requirement. You had to take two classes at a community college to graduate from Biola. Two classes at a community college. Hmm. Right, guys, it's so easy to get out of this bubble. Go take some classes at a community college, and you'll be immersed, and then seek to sew within the community college. But you would have to pay Biola for taking those classes. <laughs> Or you wouldn't be president for long. <laughs> <laughs> but wasn't that Lewis's comment? Didn't he say if he ran a seminary before you could graduate, you'd have to go to the docks of England and explain a theological yeah. concept to a dock worker? Yeah, that's what Lewis uh, said. If he, if he was in charge of the Anglican clergy, he wouldn't let anybody in unless they could go down to the docks of London and explain a complex theological concept so they could understand. And it wasn't because he had a burden for dock workers. It's because he figured if you can't do that, you don't even understand it yourself. And Lewis taught that what we really are as Christians is translators. And I think that's genius. Our, our goal is to translate complicated theological things into the constantly changing language of our culture. Yeah, huge. That's what ambassadors do. Yeah. Oh, let's get Laney. Hang on, I'm Sean. sorry. Let's get Portugal right behind you, Laney. If I was running Biola, and thank God I'm not. 
<laughs> if I was, I, I would hand out some assignments to people where you have to go find non-Christian people and just ask them a list of questions. When someone says, I'm not ready yet, what they mean is, I don't have the speech ready. I don't have the answers to all the potentially hostile questions. I don't know how to tell them what I need to tell them. And that's why the way you get started is you start asking questions of people. We, we have a fear barrier of talking with unbelievers. What if they say this? What if they, it just keeps us from even opening our mouths at all? The simple act of opening your mouth, you begin to go, oh, gee, they're normal people and they're really not all that hostile and actually they could like me. And so that would be my first assignment. Forget the speech. Forget what you're trying to communicate. Just start asking questions of people. What do you think? Where are you from? What do you like? What do you do? And you'll find it easier and easier to interact with people. Somehow, this is what I experienced. I, what I experienced when I became a Christian at the age of 18 is that my social maturity went like this, just accelerated like this, then it went like this. And part of it is because being a part of the Great Commission, I became an insurance salesman. And every conversation was something I had to find a clever way to turn wow. to the gospel. So more and more, I just started stepping back from people. I'm not getting into that. I don't know how to... So I'm saying less and less to more and more people. It accelerated my social maturity and then it stifled it. And that's what I would like to help with. Yeah, yes. Oh, Sean, go ahead. And then we'll come back here. Sure will. Relationships that you should be starting conversations in rather than sort of having this weird reverse focus that often leads to people either getting out of contact from other people in their field or just burning out because they don't have the ability to survive for that long. Your field is your point of contact with the rest of the world. It's why it's great to have one. It's where you get to interact and live alongside other people. And, you know, and as for the challenge for people to go overseas, I'm not against missions in any way, but I always say to people, have you ever heard of the I-40 window? I invented this, so you can steal it if you like. You know, they always talk about the 1040 window. It's this window of latitudes where all the people groups are. This is who we need to reach. I like to talk about the I-40 window. Just look at I-40, how it goes across the United States. Take a few degrees of latitude on either side of that highway. That's the most significant group of people on the planet. This is where funding, sending, academics, it's all there. But sometimes when it comes to missions, we neglect it to get people across large bodies of water. So I love those missionaries. You can be a missionary at the I-40 window, too. Did you ever come in? Yeah, um, kind of going back to what you said, like I totally agree that bio ones and like I know myself, I'm really bad at harvesting. And, um, it's like so much in media we see, um, especially with kind of how sexualized our culture is and, you know, first time people are kind of characterizing themselves based on their sexual orientation. We see all these, you know, articles or whatever of Christian groups who are bashing and being really abrasive towards homosexuality. And it's like we get so timid and um, afraid of that that we almost become over tolerant and we lose, you know, sight of, okay, something still needs to be done, you know, and mm -hmm. like we love on that and that's great, but that then we get afraid of our own shadow and afraid of stepping on people's toes. And, yeah. So where is the balance there and how do you, you know, how do you... Oh, yeah. Let me touch on that first because it'll be better than somebody from Biola answering the question here. Because Tim and I have talked about this a lot over the years. Uh, let me tell you something that will surprise you, first of all. You want to be a really good sower? You want to learn to be a great sower? You know what the first step is? Learn to harvest. Because you don't have the privilege in life of specializing only as a harvester or only as a sower. You want to be able to say to somebody, this is how you become a Christian. Would you like to do so? So you learn to use a simple tool like a four spiritual laws of knowing. That's the, that's the starting point because the goal of your sowing 
is to eventually lead people to that. And you wouldn't want to spend all this time sowing and then, I'm sorry, that's all I can do with you. I'm just hoping a harvester wanders by, right? What, what Tim and I have talked about for years is young people tend to be very good at sowing or at least starting conversations, social justice, uh, all kinds of welfare things. But when it comes to bringing up the topic, oops, I might step on people's toes. Well, part of that is they just never really learned how to harvest. That's a good, necessary step. And you should ask yourselves, do I feel confident to do that? Do, do, would I know how to sit down with someone who's interested right now and just share my faith with them? Because if not, that's something you need to learn to do while you're here. So what would be a shrewd response, Tim, to the issue that we just feel like we're getting shut out on same-sex marriage? We just feel like we, we want to have the debate, we perfect our arguments, but we never get a chance to do it. We just never get a chance to have a fair, honest conversation. So what would be a shrewd response? What, how, what should we do when we feel like we're getting shut out everywhere and indirect communications killing us? I'm not sure, I don't know if I have an answer for that. Well, you know, I, I sure don't have a short one. I've got about yeah. a two hour shot at it, but I don't have a simple answer to that yeah. one too. You, there are some social issues that are enormously big, but yeah. here's my complaint. Who do you know within the Christian world who's got a really good shrewd response to this issue? Who, who do you know? The problem is we can't think of anybody. Now don't you find that odd? That we can't put our finger on anybody who, you know what, they have really given some thought to that yeah. and that's good. That, a book, a tape, a, a, you know, we can tackle this topic but I, I think it's been a hands off for some reason. Yeah. And this is where I, I say we just have a shortage of shrewdness. That's a topic that you can't just leap on. It takes real wisdom and it takes knowledge of the other side. What can I say? What can I not say? Uh, and, and we need to get together, put our heads together to come up with these things, but we just don't seem to think it's a valuable thing to do. Yeah. So from time to time, our spokespeople just jump in there and make statements and we all go, ooh, I wish he hadn't said that. Yeah. Should I read him that C.S. Lewis quote that I showed you at lunchtime? Oh, that was good. You, yeah, you guys yeah, got yeah. You gotta that was good. listen to this. Quote from C.S. Lewis, so it's inerrant. It has to be because it's C.S. Lewis. <laughs> C.S. Lewis said, well, first of all, one other quote. This is from a woman named Mary Kramer. We used to work with a guy named Kent Kramer, was on staff with Crew for years. His mom, Mary Kramer, was appointed by the president as ambassador to seven different nations in the Caribbean, Barbados and St. Vincent and the Grenadines and all these different nations. She wrote a book on being an ambassador. Listen to something she said. As I was to quickly learn, I was quite literally the representative of my country, always on stage. And that meant any position I took was accepted as the American position. Any opinion I expressed was assumed to be the opinion of the American people. No matter whether I was having a conversation at dinner or at a cocktail reception, speaking at a formal gathering, or simply attending a one-on-one -on -one meeting, I was in a fishbowl on a public stage and I never forgot it. It was a huge responsibility to be the mind and mouth of the United States and it required constant vigilance and a great deal of media savvy. Now you see the relationship you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And when you speak, it is assumed to be the Christian position, right or wrong. And the manner that you employ is assumed to be the Christian manner. And your words and your life are never off the record. That's what we need to know. And Christians are slow to learn this. You are never off the record anymore. So here's the C.S. Lewis quote. When we Christians behave badly or fail to behave well, we are making Christianity unbelievable to the outside world. The wartime posters told us that careless talk costs lives. It is equally true that careless lives cost talk. Our careless lives set the outer world talking and we give them grounds for talking in a way that throws doubt on the truth of Christianity itself. Ouch. That'd make a good title for a book, Christians Behaving Badly. <laughs> wow, but well, we should probably stop it with Lewis. Yeah.